In this episode, we preview the New York Islanders and Tampa Bay Lightning series, as well as the Montreal Canadiens versus Vegas Golden Knights series. We give you their halfway point MVPs for each team and who they think will win each series and some more analysis, of course. Hit the music. <laughs> Welcome to Jablam Sports Hockey, folks. I'm your host, Peter Borjaranov, and the mic is always on. You can find me on Twitter at Russia98. You can find the full show at Jablam Sports. If you have any questions or comments, please tweet us. Use the hashtag Jablam Sports. That's J A B L A M Sports. Please subscribe to us if you haven't done so yet, and click on the three dots in your podcasting app. Share our show with three hockey fans you know. Thank you, everyone. Remember, check out our website, go to jablamsports.com, see all our podcasts, and even game notes for each episode. You'll get links to all the things we mentioned on this show, including guests. For our podcasts, click on podcasts, and then hockey on this show specifically right on our website. Semi-finals number one, we've got Tampa Bay Lightning versus the New York Islanders. Joining to discuss and fight it out, of course, is Andy Graziano. He covers the Islanders for New York Islanders Hockey Now. You can find him on Twitter at Andy Graz underscore 19. Andy G-R-A-Z. Z, right? It's Z. Z, that's correct. Yeah, you got it right. <laughs> Not many people do. <laughs> underscore 19 it's supposed to be z right i don't know yes why. I, I do it the i do it that way but yeah uh welcome to the show andy thanks for having me appreciate it and also back on the show is matthew estevez he writes for raw charge a part of sb nation you can find him on twitter at matthew s estevez matthew thank you for coming on again hey thanks for having me again the islanders Defeat the Lightning 2-1 to one in Game 1 of the series. I feel that in watching that game, the Islanders did exactly what they wanted. Like, I'm watching the first period and I'm reading it and, like, they're playing, like, an erratic game that doesn't let the Tampa Bay Lightning flow. They don't, they're not letting them flow the game, bring up the puck. Uh, pass it around with the cycle and I was like this is exactly playing into the Islanders game even though it's still 0-0 I feel that if the Islanders can just keep this up they're good and that's basically what happened uh, like the Lightning didn't have any real strong possession game in that first one Islanders were controlling it Matthew how do the Lightning get that flow going that game was pretty much to a T what the Islanders won um, I wouldn't say the Islanders dominated that game, but the Islanders played exactly how they wanted. They got Tampa exactly where they wanted them. And Tampa kind of blinked a little bit, <clears throat> you know, when um, they let their frustration get the better of them, they started making uncharacteristic mistakes. I mean, Stan Coast doesn't really make that kind of turnover that leads to Barzal's goal. And then the Islanders are one of the toughest teams in the league to try to steal the lead from like have fun. Like they're just like Tampa. T- if Tampa gets a lead, have fun trying to get back. Yep. So what, what Tampa really needs to do, is they just need to reset. You know, they. this is the first time you're seeing New York all season. It's the first time New York's seeing um, Tampa all season. But I feel like New York's style is a little easier to apply on teams you haven't seen before because New York is just such a stylistically sound team when it comes to their structure that you need to see it a little bit to kind of figure out how you're going to attack it. Now, yes, we saw them last year in the conference in the conference final, but year to year, it's, you know, there's little things that are different. You forget. I mean, Christ, the last time we played this team was what? Shoot. August, September. Yeah. Last year. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. Last year. So, yep. I mean, that's a, that's a long time. And yeah. I guarantee you a, a coach like trots and those players on that team have like adjusted things and done things a little differently. So biggest thing is Tampa just needs to reset. They need to, focus on not making as many unforced errors because a lot of them really were unforced. And it, and it and that came from New York's approach. You know, New York just gave you nothing. Mm-hmm. And New York's like, we dare you to try something. Dare you. <laughs> and we tried and we got bit. And that's that, that's how playoff hockey goes sometimes, you know? Um, 
Vasilevsky, I don't think had a necessarily strong game. I don't think that Barzol goal was one that he normally lets up. Mm-hmm. Um, I also think a part of that was Barzol kind of stuttering a little bit and it caught him off guard. Um, and then that that uh, Pulak shot from the point, there's no reason that goal should have went in. Yeah, it's got to be stopped. Com- he yeah. completely whiffed on that one. Yep. Yeah. Well, the Islanders, I don't know if a lot of people notice this, but they're leading the league in goals in the playoffs. They've gotten it done by committee. And you got to give it to Lou by making a big that trade. I don't think a lot of people remember they made a, that splash that nobody even thought too much about. But getting Nick Palmieri and Travis Ajak is looking like the best move at the deadline. Palmieri's leading the team in goals. He's fourth in the league with seven. How is he not like your common league scorer? He's been so under the radar. But he's really stepped it up. Andy? Yeah, I think Palmieri, when he first came in, really struggled to fit in. Um, And I think Barry, to a certain degree, had a tough time finding the right place for him. Um, He was, funny enough, never put with Matthew Barzal on that top line for defensive reasons. Lou just didn't feel that that line would have been good enough defensively, which is the reason why... Leo Komarov, who would not play probably third line for a lot of teams in this league, honestly, is playing on the Islanders' first line. It's purely for defensive reasons because it allows Barzal and Eberle to be kind of as creative as they want to be yeah. or try to be um, without having to worry too much because um, Leo's usually there to cover for any defensive deficiencies that, that might create, that might result from that. Um, I think Paul Mary, ever since they put him with J.G. Pajot, it, it's been just sort of like – sprinkling magic dust on them and then you throw Travis Ajak in the mix who Palmieri obviously is very familiar with Mm -hmm. and you have three guys who have become pretty quickly very comfortable playing with each other and I think that's what makes the Islanders tough to defend Um, okay if you want to shut down Barzal and Eberle we'll roll out the Nelson Bailey Beauvillier line which has probably been their most consistent line all postseason you shut them down okay now we'll come out with JG Pajot Palmieri and Zajac we you want to bang and crash, we'll bring out the fourth line, which can do that probably with the best of anybody. Um, I, I admit what Matthew said. It, it was a little uncharacteristic for me to see how the Lightning played in game one. It's not something I've seen often. And I'll be honest, I was very, I'm not going to say pessimistic. Uh, I, w- I would say cautiously optimistic coming into this series. I knew the Islanders could play with them, but I also respect the talent on that Tampa roster, how they're coached, how they play their system, their power play. You just can't put them on the power play. As we saw in game one, five on five, the Islanders, I thought, had a pretty decent control of the game. Um, The Lightning in the third period had only six scoring chances and two high danger scoring chances in the third period trailing. Um, That to me is just incredible. Um, And I don't know right now if... We'll find out tomorrow night if that was more to what the Islanders did or was it the Lightning just for some reason in game not adjusting to what the Islanders were doing. Um, But I I thought going back to last year that these teams were a little more evenly matched than some people were giving the Islanders credit for. Um, You know, the the Lightning are Stanley Cup or earned Stanley Cup champions. They deserve that every bit of that title. And to beat the best, to be the best, you got to beat the best. That's kind of how I felt coming into this series. But I didn't feel that the teams were as far apart as everybody was making it sound. Sure, special teams, absolutely. We can't stand a chance if we put Tampa on too many power plays. This series is going to be over quick if we take three, four, five penalties a night. Mm-hmm. Right? We've seen it against Florida. We saw it against Carolina. 42% on the power play, really? I mean, you just have to stay out of the box. And I thought that's Video what the Islanders... Numbers. Exactly. And I thought that's what the Islanders did really, really well yesterday is when they got comfortable in the game and they started playing as Matthew said their system they also were very disciplined in staying out of the box and not giving Tampa any momentum to really build on and I'm fully expecting to see a much different Tampa team tomorrow night to be honest all right take it easy there Ric Flair Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I got that reference all right following up on that though I man the Firepower of that high octane offense from the Lightning is great. You got that top four guys; they're scoring on all those goals. 
But with the lack of opportunities with the Islander style and less power play time, which is what Andy mentioned, how, Matthew, how does the Lightning get it back on the five on five? Yeah, Tampa wasn't necessarily, what Tampa really, actually, honestly, they really haven't been as strong at five on five this season as they were last season, especially yeah, the playoffs. Yep. Yep. Last year, Tampa was kind of like a buzzsaw. They just basically did whatever the heck they want. They blew out every team they played at least once, yep. which is bizarre with how with how good these teams are. And like Andy said, I felt the Islanders had control of that game, even though it didn't feel like it. I feel like the only time Tampa really had any semblance of control at 5v5 was in the first 10 minutes. Where yep. They were just flying. The Islanders were chasing and trying to keep up. But then those two, those two penalty kills came up. And those two roughings by Goudreau. And then the Islanders really settled in and they said, all right, we're just going to play our game. And then from there, it was really, really rough for Tampa to get anything at 5v5. So what they got to do in game two, utilize their speed more. If New York is going to step up and try to cut things off from zone entries, dump it in. This team dumps, dumps and chase a lot more than people give them credit for. I know Braden Point is one of the best players in the entire league when it comes to controlled zone entries, but... Tampa's not afraid to just dump the puck in and go. I mean, we made a living off of that with our third line in playoffs last year with Gord, Goodrow, and Coleman. You know, every line can do it. And we need to kind of get a little bit behind New York's defense. Right now, they're trying to just sit there saying, we dare you to do something. You know, and we're chipping it in too soft. And New York's just recovering it and just... And the thing, the thing is, is, like what Andy was talking about, how New York doesn't get credit. Yeah, they really don't. I mean, do they have the star power that Tampa does? No, they don't. They have Barzal. Barzal's a great player, but you put... New York's forward core against Tampa, you go like, yeah, I'm going to pick Tampa's more times than not. Yep. Yep. But at the end of the day, there's still quality, good NHL players. And I think the Islanders' defense is severely underrated. They got some fantastic players. I mean, I, th- I didn't think they'd be that great once, once they traded Taves, but they look great back there. Like they really do. They move the puck well, they don't make a ton of mistakes, and they force you into really, really precarious positions. And I think that's something that really, really helped New York in the first game. So I feel like on top of just dumping and chasing, we've got to start making life difficult for the defensemen, especially Pollock and Pellick. Yep. Those two drive everything yep. for New York. You make their life diff- – it's kind of the same thing that happened in the first round series against Florida. You attack the focal point of their of, their, of what drives their offense forward, which for Florida it was Mackenzie Weger. For Carolina it was Dougie Hamilton and Jacob Slavin. And now here we got we got we got to make life difficult for Pollock and Pellick. You make that you make you make life difficult for them. It starts trickling. It starts trickling down to the Nick Lades, who's still a good player, but he's not he's not to the same level as Pulak or Pelik or anything like that. But you make their life difficult. It makes everyone else's life life difficult. And I don't feel I don't feel like Tampa really made New York's life difficult at all throughout the entire game. No, they lost a lot of they lost a lot of those 50-50 puck battles, Matthew. Mm-hmm. Right, that got that guys that analyze the game and like yep. you know we all do. We always talk about the 50-50 puck battles, and you're right. When Tampa did finally get to that chip and chase mentality, they just could never seem to win the puck back in the board battles. You saw the board battle that led to the Pollock goal, where Eberle and Komarov basically just out-bustled on the boards, won the puck back to Pollock for the goal. That, you and I both agree, Vasilevsky should have probably stopped nine and a half times out of ten. Mm-hmm. Um, but and, and again, I think that's what kind of Cooper was talking about post game. He was talking about the fact that he felt his team beat themselves more than the Islanders beat them. Now, that's just a coach also pumping up his team and making sure he doesn't get too down on his squad after one loss, which is what John Cooper does really well. And again, fans look at that on Twitter and they're like, oh, my God, this guy doesn't give us any credit. No, it's not that. It's just that what do you want the coach to say right in the, the first game of the I still call it the conference finals. I don't care what the NHL wants yeah, to call I do, it. Yeah, I do too. I don't care what the NHL wants to call it. I can't wait till next year we go back to normal. But uh, oh yeah. Ugh. So yeah, that's yeah. I, I mean that's a, that's a terrific point, Matthew. I think they 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 if they're going to be successful in this series, they're going to have to win those 50-50 puck battles on the boards. It, it's if they keep if they continue to lose those and continue to lose faceoffs like they did in Game One, which was really one sided. Um, it, it, it could be it could be a, a tough battle for them, a tougher battle than maybe they anticipated. To add on to your point of of those faceoffs, I'm not really a gigantic proponent of like faceoffs in general being a, a hugely important thing, but I, I, am, I am a big proponent of key faceoffs, and right. I felt like I every agree. single key faceoff in that they game, lost. the Islanders just yep. said nope, ours, yep. taking yep. away, running away with it. Yep. And that's and they have one of the best faceoff men in the league in Peugeot. He's mm-hmm. not on the Bergeron level, but he's close. And 
I think you'll see Pajot this series take a lot of those, as you said, key faceoffs, and it's going to be up to the Lightning centerman to adjust and and kind of even out that score a little bit uh, to kind of gain that offense, especially on the Lightning offensive zone faceoffs where they have yep. to gain that puck possession back. Yep. The interesting thing there is that Tampa, throughout all of Cooper's tenure, has never been an especially strong face right, I think right. I think they've hovered around the 48, 49%. Yep. So they're, they're basically 50 50. Um, but our best face off guys are essentially Stamkos. Surprisingly, Tyler Johnson has gotten better over the past two years. And Sorelli is. Nah, he's okay at faceoffs, but Braden Point surprisingly has not been strong on faceoffs. He's never been strong on faceoffs. I'm not sure if it's just the experience, but he he's been in the league for quite a while. But it's just interesting that he doesn't win nearly as many faces as you think as, he, as you think he would. Now he makes up for that for given the fact he's he's a tenacious. He does everything else will. <laughs> yeah, he does everything else well. But I, I'm a I'm a complete agree with you that we need to start winning those key faceoffs. Yeah. Um, like I said earlier, got to start making life difficult for the Islanders defense because yep. that's that's where every well, I mean, with every NHL team, it's like this, but especially with a team as structurally sound as New York, like everything comes from the back end. If yep. you can disrupt the back end, you disrupt everything else, because when it comes to gifted puck movers up front, you've got Barzal. Pajot, I think, is severely underrated on that aspect. Like, yes, he's more of a banger, but pajot has got a deceptive amount of skill that just enables him to just be a little terror. Yep. Entering um, the zone. Yeah. With his yep. zone entries are better than people give him credit for. Yeah. Absolutely. He, he's, he's, de- he's deceptive there. Yep. Um, and then, I mean, guys like Palmieri, I mean, Palmieri is just a good consistent secondary score and he's filled in a role that I don't think the Islanders really had that well yep. last year. And they really lost this year with Anders Lee. Anders and like, Lee, yep. it, like Andy said, um, he, it took him a little bit. I think that's more so just how Trotz does things. You know, so sometimes things work well with Trotz right after bat. Other times it takes a little bit of time. And Paul Mieri is rewarding that patience. You know, he's been phenomenal for them. Exactly what we all expected him to be when he first showed up. Um, and everything like that. Um, and also another thing I forgot to add is actually make Simeon Varlamo's life difficult because I don't think that man broke a sweat. I really it wasn't don't. too bad. <laughs> it wasn't too bad. Like I wonder, I wonder if he was just sitting there, like singing Russian lullabies to himself. And Bralov was, like, oh. was extremely <laughs> complimentary to Vasilevsky after the game. It's like he said, "Look, we're on different teams, and we both want to win here." But he, he was very complimentary of Vazzy. And um, again, I th- I looked at this series coming in as Vazzy being the best goalie in the land. Um, however, Varlamov was playing outside of the Marshawn goal that he gave up in overtime. Um, has been playing really, really well also since he recovered from that little minor nick that he picked up in the Pittsburgh series. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've seen it before. We've all seen it. You know, you can ride a hot goaltender. Look what Montreal's doing with Carey Price. You can ride a hot goaltender a pretty long way in the Stanley Cup playoffs when you only need two goals to win. And Varlamov, I mean, Varlamov's earned his streaky reputation, but when Varlamov is on, it's hard to beat him. Yeah, he's moving well. You saw him move well laterally on the Stamkos denial mm-hmm. yesterday when Stamkos mm-hmm. had a pretty good look at the net and, and Rolamov slid over side to side to side. So, yep. So, like, I mean, like I said, on paper you pick you pick Tampa, but like this this is why we this is why we play the games. Yep. You know, things can go wrong in games. Things can just feel off, like Gabe Lynn did for Tampa, um, or things can just go perfect the way they did for New York. And I'm not saying New York like lucked into this win. They didn't. They earned this thing 100. percent But that game was textbook. How New York wants us to go. We give yep. you nothing. We get one break. We score on it, and then we just lock you down. Now, there's the obvious obvious issue of eventually it's going to come bite them. the The caveat to that is, can Tampa bounce back quick enough right. to make it matter? Because let's just say tomorrow ends up being a higher scoring. Let's say it just goes like three, two, four, four, three, or something like that, and New York gets a break. Well, now you're looking at a huge hill to climb up against the Islanders. You got to, like, one, you got to pull even, and then you got to, you know, win even more games against a team that just makes life absolutely difficult. Like, game two is huge. Absolutely. And don't forget, you, you, we, we, we have that kind of added intrigue this year. Like, I don't think we saw any bit of snarl outside of the first 10 seconds of game one. I think this series is going to get a lot nastier. I think it's going to get a lot more snarl to it. If you remember last year, I think it was yep. game three had like over 70 penalty minutes. It was all yep. that stuff late in the third period. Yep. Um, and you have the crowd factor this year. This is the first time they're playing with full, full, and I'm not sure how often you get a chance to visit the Nassau Coliseum, but that place is an absolute asylum. Rocket. Is, that place is, is rocking. And that, that really can be uh, that kind of 
I'll say sixth man. They say sixth man, but I'll say seventh man if I equate it to hockey. But I got you. That can really be that boost. Um, and I think the Islanders – look, if you're the Islanders, you want to go for the throat. You have to mm-hmm. go for the win tomorrow night, obviously. You have to go for the throat. However, playing devil's advocate and, you know, as good as both these teams are and as good as both these teams are playing, even if the Islanders were to drop game two, you're still coming home with a split which in the playoffs is what you always mm-hmm. kind of set your bottom bar at. Your bottom yeah. bar is a split. You go for the throw, try to win the two on the road, but your bottom bar is always that split. Um, so I think the Islanders in game one were able to accomplish what they set out to accomplish and at the same time give themselves a little confidence that, hey, we can play with these guys regardless of what everybody's saying. Um, and that, that could be a big factor as well. But as I said prior sh- to the show starting – I'm fully expecting to see a much more competitive and a much more different, aggressive uh, Tampa team tomorrow night with with less self-inflicted turnovers. Yeah, no, I completely agree. <clears throat> I completely agree with you, hundred um, percent. And even like, and even approach this topic of of last year's series. Um, I saw a lot of people on our end be like, oh, we're going to blow the Islanders out. I'm like, yo, guys, you got to start realizing that that game one last season was a fluke. One day <laughs> like, rest. Yeah. One day rest off of, off an unbelievably grinding well, and, series. And that was the Islanders' fifth series, if you remember, because they had to do the yep. play-in series. Yep. That was already their fifth series on a day's yep. rest. They had no Sezekis. And then in game five of that series, Pellet breaks his wrist and mm-hmm. ends up missing game six and having surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's – like I said, that's why I said earlier, I thought these teams coming in were a little closer, a lot closer, actually, than some, not all, that some were giving credit for. Um, I had this series going seven from the start. So we'll see. We'll yeah. kind of see where this takes us. Minimum for me was six. Right. Minimum. Like, I just, I felt like I felt like both teams were going to split the home games. No right. matter what, all first right. four was going to split. And then game five was going to be the big seal breaker, whoever. Yep. Whoever takes game five is really going to be in the driver's seat. And they're going to just put, and both of these teams are exceptionally good at it. They're going to put their foot down and just not let you breathe. Yeah. You saw what, yeah. The Islanders did that to Boston and then, and then uh, the lightning did that to Carolina very well. They didn't give them really much of a sniff. I also that, don't, I don't feel like, like, I still don't feel like New York's gotten enough credit for like just absolutely just suffocating Boston. You know, it's one thing it's Pittsburgh because I don't think I don't think Pittsburgh is necessarily as great <laughs> as everyone thinks they are, and their goaltending completely took a nosedive. Yeah, um, Tristan Jarry, Tristan Jarry, between you, you saw it. I we all saw it. Tristan Jarry was out of it. Gave us a lot of gifts. He was he gave out us of it. a lot of gifts, he and then Rask had the labrum issue. Played well a couple of games. Totally, totally crapped the bed in Game Six. Um, but I still feel like. The Islanders just suffocated Boston on that. Side. Yeah, they just didn't yeah, like. Especially yeah, Boston had the yeah, yeah, like Boston had the volume absolutely. But when it came down to it, I just like I just felt like New York was in full control no matter what. They were like, yeah, go ahead, take those shots. Right, you ain't gonna score From the outside. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, I I just woke up from my nap. <laughs> it kind of cut you out there. Folks. Sorry yeah, about we that. kind of we, it kind of came a two man show here of us just going. Don't worry, we got this. Don't I'm worry sorry about, about that. What's going on here? Are we we're talking hockey. Is that what's going on? Oh, oh yeah, that's right. Okay, uh, let me get in a question here. How about that? Can I get in a question? All right. Sorry, man. We started talking hockey. It's what we do. All right. That's you guys uh, touched base on a few things. Uh, I did want to go back to. Uh, the goaltending, and you and you and and you mentioned it a little bit that uh, Verlamov is really underrated. Even Matthew mentioned it too, like the way he's played, and even last year, phenomenal. And like I don't know how you do this. He's if you go back to the, even the regular season, he was the second best goaltender in save percentage. He was right yeah, there behind. He, he, he could have been a Vesna, uh, Vesna Trophy uh, finalist. He could have been. Yeah, he could have been. Should have been over Grubauer, in my opinion. Yeah, but well, that's neither here nor there. That's, yeah, that's for another day. Win yeah. stat. Win stat. So important. Even though wins <laughs> is a goaltending stat. And uh, during the playoffs, he's he's up there with all of them. A 930 mm-hmm. save percentage as well. So he's playing extremely well in the playoffs, as we've seen. So how come we don't put him in the same tier as Carey Price, Marc-Andre Fleury, or the one on the other side of the ice, Vasilevsky. What does Varlamov have to do to put him in that echelon of goaltenders? Does he need to win, win this cup? Does he need to yeah, win a Vesna? 
Yeah. Hey, look at I mean, Mark Andre Fleury is just Mark Andre Fleury. I mean, I was I had the the fortunate luck of being in Vegas for game two of their series against Minnesota. And uh, my son and I got tickets and got to experience for the first time the the Vegas hockey experience. Mm. And to see Mark Andre Fleury, I, I've always obviously been covering the game for eight years as a credentialed writer. So I've seen him. I've talked to him. But to actually sit there as a fan and see him live. Uh, just like it's just a whole nother level of appreciation for how how he's playing um and he's won right andre vasilevsky is one mm-hmm. uh, so i think at the end of the day Simeon varlamov just has to do one thing just has to win and that should put him in that same conversation once he once he gets over the hump so to speak and he has had some as matthew said consistency issues in the past so maybe that's another reason why people kind of don't um quote unquote trust him as much as they would trust the other guys who have won in this league and won stanley cups So on the other side of the ice, of course, as mentioned before, he's the reigning Stanley Cup champion, the 2019 Vezza winner, and quite possibly pretty much could win it again this year. Vasi put this team on the back, on his back during the season because they were missing Kucherov and he was, he could be even nominated for the heart in my opinion, uh, with the Islanders' solid defensive style, and you even saw in Game 1, he maybe flubbed in one or two of those. He's going to really need to limit those, you know, those flubs, those errors. Can he do that against the Islanders? Oh, I don't even think that's even a question to be asked. I mean, this is Andre Vastelisky we're talking about. He is... <clears throat> he's completely flipped a switch starting last postseason. Like, last postseason, he was a wall... Um, And this season, he somehow elevated his play. He has been easily the team's MVP. Uh, Easily could have gotten Conn Smythe votes last year. Well, he did, but he should have been gotten more. Uh, That's a different discussion. I still think someone else should have won the Conn Smythe over Hedman, but that's neither here nor there. Um, But sometimes goalies just have off days. It happens. And like I said earlier, like – You'd like him to have the Barzal goal, Barzal goal mm-hmm. but I still feel like Barzal faked him out there a little bit and he just caught him off guard. Whereas the Pulak goal, he's got to have that. There's no screen. It's from far out. I know Pulak's got a heavy shot and stuff like that, but that's still a shot you expect a goalie like Vasilevsky to stop every single time. And there's just no way to cut around that. And a goalie like him, with the way that he is, that man, that man is a maniac, let me tell you. Um He'll bounce back. There's no worry for us about him bouncing back. Um, biggest thing is we have to make his job a little easier. The Lightning do. Um, all those, like I think I saw a tweet about it. Like New York dominated rush chances. It was like nine nothing. Like New York gave us nothing, and they had a ton of rush chances. I mean, Barzal's goal was a rush chance. Like, got to limit those because those are essentially fifty fifties when you really break it down. Because it all comes, it all comes down to an instant read, but the goaltender and the shooter, and it's a 50-50. So you can't. You can only blame the goaltender so much on those before you expect you. Know, you, you can't keep letting these guys getting breakaways or two on ones. Yep. You know. So if Tampa limits the turnovers and makes Fassi's life a bit less chaotic, they'll be fine. Um, but the thing is, they have to execute that, and they they have to execute that against one of the most detailed and execute oriented teams in the entire league. So it just comes down to returning to their game plan and reverting to back to what won a champion, won them a championship last year. What I find interesting about the Barzal goal is if you watch that goal again, you kind of see Vasilevsky take his stick and start going for like, mm-hmm. I think he thought Barzal was going to cut yeah. to his backhand because yep. Vasilevsky was already cheating with his stick to go for the poke check. And that kind of opened up the five hole and Barzal just, you know, fortunately at that okay. half a second, it's almost like in baseball when they say you have half a second to determine, um, you know, rotation speed and location same thing for a goalie and that that all happens we see it on tv in it but it, it's happening a lot quicker on the ice yep. um so that that i thought was interesting about that barzal goal he definitely thought barzal was going backhand yeah yep before you guys go i want you guys to pick your mvps for your teams so far matthew who's the mvp so far for tampa are we, talk, are we talking regular season or just postseason uh, just, yeah <laughs> just the postseason halfway point of the playoffs who's your con smite for the halfway point Probably a two-way tie between Point and Vasilevsky right now. Oh, two went two-way tie. Oh man, it's hard. It's hard, man, because <laughs> because let's be honest, Vasilevsky wasn't as sharp as he should have been against Florida, except for Game Six. He was sharp Carol- against Carolina, except Carolina- for the one game. The six-four game was the only. Yeah, app, you know, Carolina. Average. He was pretty much 
Vasilevsky for every game except for that one game. Yep. Um, and honestly, like you can only really blame one goal on him in game one. Um, whereas Point has been a buzzsaw the entire postseason. Yep. He, I mean, he leads the league in goals right now. Yep. Um, he's been a buzzsaw. He's been noticeable every single time he's on the ice. I think he's only not been noticeable one game. I think that was game five against Florida. And then he came out and just made Florida's life absolute hell in game six. Yep. So it's hard to really lean one way or the other. If, if you're going to twist my arm and say which one, I'll say point. <laughs> yeah. There you go. We got him to commit. There you go. Andy, <laughs> who's your MVP? I'm going to go. Uh, I'm going to say someone. I, and I don't know. Maybe people will expect this. Maybe they won't. It, it, for me, it's Adam Pellick. Uh, he has been just an absolute monster in this postseason. Um, and he is looking at a mighty big payday um, when everything is all said and done because he is he has been by far for me the island the Islanders best defenseman. Um, for me, he he definitely deserves Con Smythe consideration. Again, you can find him on Twitter at Matthew S. Estevez for Matthew and at Andy Graz underscore. 19 for Andy. Thank you for stopping by, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you very you much. For having Matt, me. Thanks. Good luck. Hey man, you too. All right. What what good luck? Come on. I want I want some punches here. <laughs> there's no we're, there's we're, no there's, we're, there's no ill will here. Yeah. Man. Look, Matthew will tell you one when when we started writing and we got credentialed and stuff, it takes the fan aspect it like, really does out of it. And, and I, I kind of miss it. I miss it. Like it's still there in my tweets a little bit, but Me when too. it goes to my writings, like you got to be objected to a certain yep. extent. Like yep. as much as as much as it's aggravating of like, oh, the Islanders play boring hockey. <laughs> yeah, they play good defense. I mean, you can't dispute that, man. Like they're a fantastic team on the back end, and they drive it forward. Like you have to respect that. My look, goodness. my wife and son are Ranger fans. Okay? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I have learned. I'm to, so uh, sorry. I've learned. I have learned. The, put my fan card in my pocket and play it right down the middle and play nice. It's only sports. It's only sports. Get out of here. <laughs> hey, you guys are hitting each other with pillows and stuff. I want to see some. Hey man, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not here for the hot takes. I'm here for good quality. Discussion, there you right? go. There you go. Good quality content. All right. Go lighty. I hold your hands. The rest of this series. Have a good night. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Thanks for having us on. Appreciate it. Thanks man. I appreciate it. Semi-finals and number two, we've got Montreal Canadiens versus the Vegas Golden Knights. Joining to discuss is Blaine Potvin. He covers the Montreal Canadiens for the Hockey Writer, and you can hear him on the podcast Habs Unfiltered. You can find him on Twitter at Blaine Potvin underscore THW. Thank you for coming on the show, Blaine. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on, Peter. So we'll have all the links to all the guests on our show, including uh, where you can find them, their shows, or where they're on, of course, for Blaine on uh, his podcast, Habs Unfiltered. So we'll have the link to his anchor page for that one right on the website. And that'll be jablamsports.com, of course. This is Season 6, Episode 27. So check the game notes for that. We are recording this one right before the game tonight. Are you, are you excited? Well, I mean, it, <laughs> not excited for a semifinal game when you were not supposed to be at one. Yeah. I don't know what's wrong with you. Yeah, yeah that's true. Uh, so let's set up Mr. Potman for failure. Who's going to win this series in how many games? No, 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 no. We'll leave that till the end. Let's leave that till the <laughs> end. Uh, first off, I really do think, I was thinking about this Obviously, Montreal swept the Jets. And I was thinking about this before, and I was like, who do they really want to face? Obviously, they're both juggernauts, the Colorado Avalanche and the Vegas Golden Knights. But who would they want to face more? In in my mind, it really was the Avalanche. I feel that they're a more high offensive team that relies more on one line and they've shown at least so far in these playoffs, they can kind of do that. They can shut down a good top line. Now they're going against Vegas. Who would have you have rather have faced first off? Um, it, it was, it was a really hard 
to kind of, to mental obstacle to figure mm-hmm. out which one. Yeah. But I did lean towards Vegas and mm-hmm. it's, it's not because I felt that they'd be an easier out because they are definitely not. Mm-hmm. Vegas is a great hockey team. I just felt that the Canadians and Vegas were built similarly mm-hmm. and the way Vegas is playing right now, it would be a better matchup for the Canadians based on how Vegas plays where the Canadians are pl- and how the Canadians are currently playing. It would be a, a, be a more beneficial matchup because I believe Colorado would have proven to be a little bit more difficult based on how they're all playing at the moment. You're thinking the opposite of what I'm thinking. Interesting. Um, so how is it? I know it's tough. It's going to be a tough series. I know there's a chance. we Everybody has shut down Montreal the first round, the second round. They're tough to overcome. And again, this is like, oh, it's even harder now. Now they're against Vegas. So it, they can beat them. How could it be possible? Well, I laid this out in the hockey writers with uh, the keys to success for the Canadians in my last article. And it comes down to the system that they're currently playing. If the, the Canadians play a system that's similar to Vegas and Vegas is going to want to play this way as well, which kind of plays into the Canadians hands a little bit. The, the Habs are going to have to keep Vegas to the boards away from the middle. They're going to have to slow the game down and by keeping it towards the boards, they'll do that. Vegas doesn't give away the puck. So you're going to have to keep them going North South and you're going to have to deal with them doing the uh, the dump and chase when they get to the blue line if they don't have a play they're not trying to go east west mm-hmm. to juke you out they're going to just throw it in and throw some heavy bodies at the defense so the canadians are going to have to deal with that and that's something they've dealt with in the first two series so they're prepared for that kind of play so as long as they keep them to the outside keep the speed element away from vegas going east west the canadians have a, a good to fair chance. It's going to be even tougher. Jeff Petrie is out at least game one. He could be out longer. How long could is it? Does it seem like he could be out with the hand injury? That's what it seems like. And who who's going to come in the lineup and even try to replace the sh- skates of particularly their best defenseman? Well, Petrie, he's definitely out game one. There's talk that he might play game two. He's got two dislocated fingers in his right hand, and he's playing with a, uh, a, a, a modified glove. So if he does play, clearly that would be uh, – there would be some effects with his passing and shooting. The physical play and the skating and the gap control will still be there, but it's, it's that transition game that he brings that there would definitely be an issue. Replacing him, you can't. You just can't. So you're going to have to rely on – people like Weber and Sherrod and Edmondson to step their games up a little bit and eat up some of the uh, responsibility. Romanov is going to slot in and he didn't play a lot in his last game in game four versus Winnipeg, but he played a flawless mistake free game. And that's what they're going to need from him uh, in uh, game one. So he might play 12, he might play 14 minutes, but however much he plays, He's going to have to play flawless, mistake-free hockey. Coach Dom Ducharme, he started the playoffs. He wasn't playing the young guys, right? Uh, Cole Caulfield, uh, Kakanemi didn't play. They got in the lineup, and they just bang and bang, and they were just firing on all cylinders, and they've been great. Romanov has been sitting in the press box for most of these playoffs. Do you think he might have maybe learned something while sitting in the press box watching these games, and then he might be a little bit better because of that? Is Coach Dom Ducharme actually his his, his magical wizard things working? Well, um, you can't argue with the results so far. Mm-hmm. I mean, granted, Romanov only played the one game, and he only played a little over 10 minutes. With Romanov in the regular season, the issues for him was that he was extending his shifts too long. So he'd be out there for a minute and a half, little bit longer and Ducharme wanted him to shorten his shifts and in the game against Winnipeg in game four 
we saw 50 second to one minute shifts religiously. He'd go out, play his short shift and get off the ice. So if that's what he learned and it's working, then let's hope it continues. Hmm. We'll see uh, as early as the na- this game tonight. Um, one thing I want to touch base on, and I don't know about uh, people within the Montreal area, but outside, I don't know. I think some people might be wondering where is Jonathan Drouin? And we, like, I do know, I know he's taking a leave of absence, but if this was going on in a different fan base, like maybe not in Canada, maybe not in Toronto, Montreal, but say Boston, there would be a little bit of an uproar. We saw that with Tuca last year. How is everybody just like, oh, okay, like he's dealing with something and may- maybe it's personal or a family matter. We're going to leave him alone. Well, the majority of the fan base is doing that now. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to counter that if this was in another, in another hockey market, mm-hmm. this would not be an issue. The, uh, the abuse that uh, Drouin has taken for simply being traded into the team and not being the next Guy Lafleur, the, the abuse he took was beyond reasonable. So his, his leave of absence, I don't think would have happened in any other market, but it's happening here now. And all we can do is just wish him the best and hope that whatever it is that's keeping him outside of the, uh, the, uh, the arena gets sorted out so he can continue his career, whether it be in Montreal or anywhere else. Yeah, we do wish him the best of luck. Montreal is one of the teams that is... Again, if they had a player like Duran playing, it would help them because they don't have anybody in, in up there in offense, right? If you look at stats right now, if you look at who the leaders, they don't have anybody in goals or in points in the top 15 in these playoffs. If I know some teams, we've seen some, and Montreal did a great job of shutting down uh, Matthews and Marner, and they're going to need to do that again in this round. Um, and again, they got, you know, Stupid, uh, foolish play by Shifley. But they're going to need maybe to rely on someone a little bit more. And there isn't really any way. Like Toffoli has four goals and a couple of guys have four goals. Is there someone or two players that they can try to lean on a little bit more to maybe get more oomph, more goals out of? Well, with Toffoli, he he didn't score whatsoever in the first half dozen games. Mm -hmm. In the, in the playoffs. Once he got his first goal, he, it started to roll for him. He really started to shine in that Jets series. And <clears throat> the expectation is he'll continue. For the Canadians scoring, they're, they're doing it by committee, just like the, uh, the Vegas Golden Knights. They don't have any, like one superstar goal scorer, like, uh, like an Ovechkin. Uh, granted, Pacioretty is a very good goal scorer. Mark Stone is a great two-way player. But they're not... They're not those guys that you rely on for offense, uh, you know, at a, at the drop of a hat. So like the, uh, the golden Knights, the Canadians have to score by committee. One player that Habs fans are kind of hoping to see more from offensively is Caulfield. Now Caulfield's played extremely well, two way game. He has generated a ton of scoring chances. He's uh, he's put up some pretty big assist on uh, two overtime goals, Mm -hmm. but he, he, he needs to get that puck in the net. And once he gets that first one, I think it's going to be the floodgates are going to open and we're going to see a different a different level from this young man. Is there maybe a better fit for Caulfield? Because he is that type of guy that's good at finding areas and being ready for that shot. And it seems like he's not maybe being utilized in that role per se that he can score a lot where it seems like like we saw the overtime winner, he's great job, digged out the puck and set up to Foley. And we've seen some other great passes, but he is a scorer. So what's missing for that? I don't think it's anything that's um, that's being done to help him. I, I, I think with Suzuki, he's got the right center 
for his type of game because Suzuki has a great on ice vision. He anticipates the play well. He can see how it plays developing and he anticipates where Caulfield is. There's been quite a few plays that Suzuki has generated and Caulfield just didn't quite get the puck over the shoulder or, you know, it, it's just these, a game of inches for, for Caulfield. He's at, he's still a rookie. He hasn't played, he's played, I think it's 16 NHL games total. So it, it's a matter of him <clears throat> understanding how to get a shot off a little bit quicker and just a slightly bit more accurate and not worrying about if he's playing perfect or not because the chances are there. He's, he's getting the chances. So I'm not concerned right now because the chances are there. I, I do see that eventually they're going to start to fall. Before we go, two quick questions. Number one, MVP. I like to ask it usually at the halfway point who the MVP is for the team. Is it the obvious answer, Carey Price? Yeah. Yes, yeah, the obvious answer. All right. And then the last one, which I love to ask, is who is going to win this series and in how many games? Well, unlike the uh, majority of pundits, I'm actually looking at a long series. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at a seven-game series. I mean, these two teams do match up really well with their styles of play. Um, Obviously, Vegas gets the nod for uh, being being the favorites. But I do see a path for the Canadians to win. uh, They've played a confident brand of hockey. They've gone up against one of the fastest teams in the NHL with Toronto. They've gone up against one of the deepest top nines with size in Winnipeg. Granted, one of their top nine took himself out, but that's his problem. And he looked like crap in his first game against Montreal, which is his level of frustration is what caused him to get suspended. So that's the kind of game that the Canadians have to play if they want to win. Mm -hmm. Um, Clearly, they are the underdogs, but I can see them pulling out a series win. It, It is very possible. I've got Vegas in six, I still think. And I still think Montreal can maybe take them to seven. It's going to be a better and more interesting series than a lot of people have them out for. And good luck for the Habs. Again, you can find them on Twitter at Blaine Potvin underscore THW. Blaine, thank you for stopping by on the pod. Peter, thank you very much for having me. Anytime you need me again, uh, just give me a call. I want to thank our guests on this episode. Thank you to Matthew Estevez, Andy Graziano, and of course, Blaine Potvin for joining in. All these series seem pretty interesting. I know a lot of people think that these could be easy series, but no, don't, don't, don't think that the Islanders and the Montreal are just going to be easy. They're not. I think all of the series are going to go at least six games. So don't be shocked when they do. And they will. They will go the distance. So enjoy this round. Round two is fabulous. This round's going to be just as good. These playoffs are fantastic. Enjoy the playoffs. And again, thank you to my guests this week. Remember, if you've enjoyed anything you've heard in this episode or don't, Please tweet at me or even our guests. You can follow me on Twitter at Russia98 or the entire team at Jablam Sports. If you want, you can also contact us on our website. Uh, you can use the hashtag at Jablam Sports, uh, Jablam Sports, that's J A B L A M. And our website is jablamsports.com slash contact for our contact page there. Please check out our website, go to jablamsports.com to see all our podcasts and even game notes for each episode, including this one. And you'll get our guests' info and links to things we mentioned on this show. Please subscribe, rate, and review us on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify. And of course, click on the three dots in your podcasting app and share this episode with three friends you know. Please and thank you. Also, follow us on our Facebook group, Jablam Sports. Check us out, folks. Thank you, everyone. And to every one of our listeners, I'm giving you a virtual hug. Stay healthy, listen, be yourself, and stay strong. Stay strong.